to you. Well, first of all, I have to make a disclaimer. I am not an Osage. I'm not a Native American of any stripe. I'm a Scotsman of, of Scottish descent. Uh, I've had connections with the Osage tribe going back 12 years now. Uh, last year, uh, Vince, uh, Osage Chief Scott Bighorse asked me to participate with them in the anniversary of the uh, 250th uh, founding of St. Louis. And this is the program that I presented as part of that anniversary celebration. And at the end of it, the Osage tribe gave me this Pendleton blanket, uh, which was quite an honor for me. So I like to wear it when I'm giving presentations about the Osage. Um, I also make the disclaimer that it is not my intent to misrepresent or characterize the Osage or any other uh, Native American nation in any uh, way, shape, or form. Slide, please. Okay, uh, President Thomas Jefferson met with a delegation of Osage leaders in Washington in July of 1805. Following that meeting, he made this assessment. The truth is, they are the great nation south of the Missouri, their possession extending from thence to the Red River as the Sioux are great north of that river. With these two powerful nations, we must stand well because in their quarter, we are miserably weak. And as the largest and most highly organized uh, tribe immediately west of St. Louis, the Osage were in a position to block American expansion in the Louisiana Territory. The weak position that the United States was in at that time was not new. France and Spain had experienced it as well. And understand Osage relations with these imperial powers, we need to know a little basics about Osage culture. Next slide. The Osages were originally divided into two things, the Utsita, the down below people, and in Osage Sign Language, she made this sign, which the French interpreted as little. And then there were the people that live on the hills, the Pahatsi, and they made this sign to be above the hill, and the French interpreted that as big. So we had the big Osage on the Osage River and little Osage living on the Missouri River. Well, around 1786, a third group broke off from the Big Osage, and they became the Sansukti, the Arkansas Osage, and they settled in northeast Oklahoma. However, all three groups of Osage would join together in matters of mutual defense. And the Osage were one of the few native nations on the continent that could marshal their entire warrior strength on a single target. Osage uh, Elder Jim Redcorn described the action this way. The war movement was the largest act of war by the Osage tribe. Following a 10-day ceremony of preparation, warriors advanced in groups of 100 and fought by clans. All the clans of the tribe participated in the war movement. At the peak of their power, the Osage could muster 2,000 warriors for battle. War movements could be triggered by any act of violence against the Osages, and once the movement had started, it was almost impossible to halt the inflamed warriors. Well, uh, the French accommodated themselves to this reality of Osage power. And beginning in the 1680s, the Osage visited Jesuit missions in Illinois country, not for spiritual enlightenment, but for the trade in guns, axes, knives, and blankets that grew up around the missions. In return, the French traders wanted two resources from the Osage. Furs, which were in demand in Europe for clothing, and slaves for laborers on the Caribbean sugar plantations. 
Now, the Osages took captives in war for untold generations, and Osages themselves have been taken captive in war. Most captives were children, young people, or women who were adopted into the tribe to replace lost relatives. The European concept of a slave supporting the lifestyle of another individual was unknown in Osage culture. However, the trade goods that the French offered for slaves was so enticing that the Osage and their Missouri allies began making slave raids against the Paducah and Pawnee on the plains. And in fact, the word Pawnee in Osage came to signify slave. Now the Jesuit priests were horrified uh, by the slave trade and they unsuccessfully com combated the traders who incited these raids. Officially, King Louis XV banned the Indian slave trade in Louisiana, but colonial officials were getting their cut of the trade, so it was uh, very easy to ignore royal edicts that were made 5,000 miles away. Now, Osage culture was extremely complex, and they held a dualistic view of the universe, and this dualistic view is reflected in tribal government. Wakanta, the creator, had established purpose, order, and balance in the universe. And the Osage saw balance in all aspects of nature. Day and night balanced each other, winter and summer balanced each other, predator and prey balanced each other, and so forth and so on. Well, to maintain uh, balance in the tribe, if you have too much war, people would get weary and the population would be reduced. If you have too much peace, it allowed your enemies to oppress you. So to maintain balance, the tribe was divided in, in, into two divisions, the Zishu, or the sky people, and the Hunka, or the earth people. Now, civil leaders came from the Zishu clans, and the Zishu clans were located on the north half of the village. The war leaders came from the Hunka clans, which were on the south half of the village, and right between the middle of each village, there was an east to west open lane, and that represented the path of the sun, the giver of life. And then in the center on either side of the, of the uh, path of life was the lodge <coughs> of the hereditary Zizhu Gahiga, or peace chief, and opposite him was the lodge of the hereditary Hunkagahiga, or war chief. Well, and underneath these chiefs were various clan chiefs and leaders of various kinds, and uh, Osage chiefs led by example, but Europeans erroneously believed that the chiefs held absolute power like a monarch did in Europe. And this resulted in a lot of diplomatic misunderstandings. Basically, the Osage people didn't like their chief. They voted with their feet, which is exactly how the Arkansas Band of the Osages came into being. Now, the real power in the Osage nation lay with the Nahanjinga, or the little old men. And these, these pictures are some of the last of the little old men taken around the turn of the 20th century. These elders were the wisest and brightest minds of the tribe. They were the spiritual and deliberative body of the nation. And in effect, they were the legislative branch of government, while the chiefs were the executive branch. And the little old men were so low profile and humble in their position that their existence remained completely unknown to whites until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, always looking out for the best interest of the Osage people, the Nonhonjinga became highly skilled in pitting European officials against each other and European powers against each other. 
Well, Europeans characterize very often the Osage as wanton, bloodthirsty murderers. However, death brought disharmony and upset the balance of the universe, so the Osage did not dispense death wantonly. There had to be a justification for causing death. Now, a victorious war party uh, resulted in wild celebration, and Osage warriors boasted of their prowess in war. But they also mourned for their slain enemies as a show of respect. And purification ceremonies were conducted for any military action that might or did result in death. And this is how they kept balance and harmony in the universe. Now, one Osage funerary custom um, was misinterpreted as an act of war. Upon the death of a relative, clan members would blacken their face and set out from the village and kill and scalp the first non-Osage that they encountered. The scalp of that person was then placed in the grave with their deceased relative. Now, the Osage belief was that the Milky Way was the road into the spirit world, and they believed that it was a long and lonely journey. So they considered it a great honor for their victim to accompany their deceased kinsman into the spirit world. Needless to say, this view was not shared by neighboring tribes and Europeans. <laughs> Uh, many reports of Osage war parties or Osage being on the warpath were actually mourning parties, and once they got their one scalp, they were done. Next slide. Well, the Nanhongjinga possessed the sacred knowledge to conduct ceremonies around which Osage life revolved. Uh, Osage elder Everett Waller described Osage society this way. I would say that in layman's terms, that we were a war society and used the elements of the animals, the other environments, and even the actual wind, the days, the time, the heat, and the cold. Now, young men could attain social status through warfare, but of the 13 war honors that an Osage man could earn, Defensive actions all at ranked higher than offensive actions. Now, sometimes young men, like all young men, got out of hand, and a group of young men found a sick, emaciated Pawnee, and they killed him. Well, there's no honor in killing a defenseless man. And the tribe was so ashamed they paid homage to the Pawnee by placing a stone on his grave whenever they passed by. And over many decades, a large rock cairn was built up over the grave of this uh, Pawnee by the Osage. Now, the Osages were generally aloof when it came to Europeans. They didn't just welcome anybody into their village. Uh, they did allow select traders to come into their village, and they sought to position themselves as the middlemen between the traders and other tribes to the west. Traders caught going to other tribes were robbed, whipped, and sent back to the settlements. The message was, you can trade with us, but not anybody else. Hunters and trappers whether they were Indians or whites that were caught in Osage territory were killed. They were trespassing and stealing Osage game. <clears throat> now, French officials tolerated robberies and the occasional death of hunters rather than jeopardize the valuable fur trade and the military assistance that the Osage provided. This system of detente worked relatively well in Osage and French relations from 1680 to 1763. In February of 1763 marked the end of the Seven Years' War, known as the French and Indian War in America. France surrounded, uh, or surrendered the Illinois country east of the Mississippi to Great Britain. And it was in this environment 
that the new post of St. Louis was established early in 1764. Back up one. There we go. And I like this picture of the founding of St. Louis because there's an angel up above blessing the <laughs> founding of St. Louis. That's something I recently found on Nash from the National Park Service. Uh, historian Carl J. Eckbert recently has published a book saying that St. Ange de Belle Reve and not uh, Pierre Laclede was the real founder of St. Louis. Well, be that as it may, and I haven't read his book yet, Pierre Laclede and his Choteau stepsons were the ones in St. Louis that came to have the greatest influence over with the Osage Nation. And the Osage hunting grounds encompassed one-eighth of Louisiana territory. And the Missouri River and the Osage River provided a convenient trade route between St. Louis and the Osage villages. So the economic prosperity of St. Louis, uh, known to the Osage as Chateauquan, meaning Choteau's town, was contingent upon its relations with the Osage nation from its very beginning. The Osage referred to Laclede and Auguste Chateau as their father, and they called them their children. Now, modern Americans view this terminology as condescending and demeaning. However, in a, the Osage were a patriarchal and patrilineal society, and fatherhood he had a special <coughs> meaning to them, even if it was symbolic. Uh, <clears throat> The Osage expected that their father would nurture them with generosity and respect, would look out for their welfare, especially in matters of trade. And this view reflected the Osage relationship to Wakanta, the creator, in whose sight they called themselves the little ones. And that denoted their humility and their dependence on the creator for their well-being. Well, in December of 1764, France ceded Louisiana to Spain to keep it out of British hands. But local Frenchmen did remain in positions of governance. Now, the Osage relationship with St. Louis continued as one of congeniality. <coughs> Many St. Louis merchants and traders had an Osage spouse as sexual intercourse came to signify the intercourse of commerce. Traders built family relations within the tribe as a way of building commercial relations. And the descendants of the Chotos and several other St. Louis traders remain on the Osage tribal rolls today. On 16, 1767, Spain finally exerted control over Louisiana and outlawed the Indian slave trade, although that traffic had been in the decline for years. <clears throat> Generosity and gift giving was and still is a common Osage practice, and I'm wearing the proof of that right here. Visiting dignitaries to Osage villages were given feasts and clothing, Blankets, horses, and anything, just about anything else with great ceremony. And this painting by George Catlin shows a similar reception amongst the Sioux uh, in 1832. Now, openly admiring an object in an Osage camp meant that it would be given to you. <laughs> the Osages expected the same kind of hospitality and generosity whenever they visited St. Louis. Well, the French, as I mentioned, understood and accommodated this custom. Spanish officials, however, found the practice tedious, irritating, and costly to their treasury. And generosity towards the Osages was also linked to the funds that were sent to St. Louis from New Orleans. And Generally, the subsidy for Upper Louisiana, now referred to as Spanish Illinois, tended to fall short 
and it arrived irregularly, and this led the Osages to view the Spaniards as miserly and stingy. And indeed, many of the officials turned out to be that way. Governor Antonio, Governor General Antonio de Uloa banned traders <coughs> from visiting Indian villages in 1768 as a cost-saving measure to the treasury. Well, angry Indians poured into St. Louis to protest. Captain Francisco Ruiz Morales tried to hold councils with the Indians, but they walked out on him. The little Osage in the Missouri had hinted that St. Louis was going to suffer reprisals for the disrespect. Captain Ruiz ordered that merchandise be dispersed to the Indians, and he informed Governor Uloa that his actions had prevented a war. However, Osage and Spanish relations continued to decline. Luis de Gonzaga became governor of Louisiana in 1770, and he observed that the English had been courting the little Osage in Missouri for several years with excessive presence. Emboldened by the weak policies of Spain and the superior trade goods they got from the British, the little Osage in Missouri started robbing traders on the Missouri River and stealing horses in St. Louis. In 1772, Lieutenant Governor Pedro Piernas could do nothing but scold the Indians for their bad behavior. Uh, the impotent response encouraged little Osage and Missouri warriors to break into Fort San Carlos just outside of St. Louis in July of 1772. They assaulted the five soldiers on duty and stripped the post of its ammunition and provisions. They then entered town, menaced the inhabitants, and raised a British Union Jack in the public square. The citizens called the warriors bluff and uh, tore the flag down. Now this incident may have been what the Osages called a bluff war. The objective of a bluff war was to intimidate an enemy and achieve the goals of warfare without killing your enemy. If these warriors had actually been part of a war movement, the soldiers and citizens in St. Louis would have been killed instantly. But the fact that they weren't, hence to me, this was bluff war. Well, Piernas decided not to punish the Osage because he feared retaliation would lead to a real war. A party of Potawatomi and Ojibwe's from up north appeared in St. Louis while the little Osage were still camped nearby. The two groups got into a fight and two little Osage chiefs were killed and a third had his arm severed. Uh, outnumbered, outgunned, the Osages retreated into St. Louis, and ironically, they were given protection by the Spanish troops that they had earlier assaulted. Piernas later decided to suspend all trade with the Little Osage and the Missouri, yet he still worried that his action might lead to war. Governor Inzaga wrote to Piernas on August 21st, 1772. There is no other remedy than their extermination, since the tolerance which we have had with them, instead of attracting them, has made them insolent. It is clear that the time has arrived when this wrong demands this last sad remedy. But we are not in a position to apply it because we lack people and supplies, and lastly, because of the expense. So, Inzaga drew a line in the sand that he knew he could not enforce. The Big Osage remained generally on peaceful terms with St. Louis, but they took out their resentment of Spanish policy by raiding the districts of Arkansas and Natchitoches. In 
in December of 1772, Governor Nzaga authorized Lieutenant Governor de Mazir at Nachitokas to completely destroy all of the Osages. He added that the extermination should take place without cost to the royal treasury, thereby negating his own policy with impossible conditions. This was a constant problem that the Spanish had in Louisiana. They lacked the resources to either pacify the Osage or to subdue them militarily. Well, on February 21st, 1773, Pyrrhus wrote to Captain Hugh Lord, who was the commandant in British Illinois. It is advisable to inform you that since certain tribes of the Missouri district among others, those of the Little Osages and the Missourias, having committed repeated attacks, even murders among the inhabitants of my jurisdiction, I decided to deprive them of every sort of supplies by not sending them a single traitor so that I might bring them to conciliation. Well, Captain Lord must have chuckled as he read the letter from Pyrrhus because the previous October, John Ducharme, one of Lord's licensed traders, had set up shop in the Little Osage and Missouri villages. Next slide. And when <clears throat> Pyrrhus found out about Ducharme, he went ballistic. On March the 11th, the, he uh, dispatched Spanish militia under Laclede to arrest Ducharme. The militia camped near Isla del Bui, Island of the Bull, just upstream from present-day Washington, Missouri. Well, Ducharme's party came around the bend in their canoes, spotted the militia camp, landed on the opposite shore, and took up defensive positions. The two sides exchanged several volleys of gunfire, and Ducharme fled into the woods, leaving his men, trade goods, and furs in the hands of the Spanish. A little Osage warrior with the group fled for home, warning his people of the approaching Spanish Navy. Now this strong military response made an impression on the Osages. The big Osage made a truce with the Spanish that lasted for nearly five years. Pyrrhus encouraged uh, the Sac Fox in Iowa. Oh, let's see. Oh, back up. Yeah, there we go. One more. There we go. I'm sorry. Uh, Pyrrhus encouraged the Sac Fox in Iowa to raid the Little Osage and Missouri, forcing them to retreat to the Osage River. The Big Osage refused to shelter their kinsmen as Spanish traders were in their villages right then and they didn't want to disrupt the trade that was going on. They told the Little Osage and the Missouri, you guys go to St. Louis and make peace. Well, in August, the treaty ceremony was concluded with smoking the sacred pipe and giving presents to the Indians. However, Governor Nzaga rightfully concluded that the peace would only be valid for the St. Louis district and not all of Spanish Louisiana. And in Osage thinking, this was correct. Peace had been made with St. Louis, but not with the rest of the Spaniards. Yeah. Sorry about that. St. Louis merchants were happy that the treaty uh, had been signed because now that meant they could resume business with the Little Osage and the Missouri, and they didn't care a whit if the Osage raids disrupted their competitors at Arkansas Post or Nachitokas. In November of 1777, Lieutenant Governor Francisco Cruzat 
reported that the Big Osages provided St. Louis with 553 packs of animal skins, the Little Osages with 154 packs of skins, and the Missourias with 90 packs of skins. That's a total of about 80,000 pounds or 40 tons of skins. And that accounted for 60% of the profits in St. Louis that year. In 1779, the Little Osage and Missouri stole so many horses in St. Louis that agricultural production became threatened. The citizens petitioned Lieutenant Governor Fernando Leba to stop the raids, but he delayed sending the petition on to New Orleans. Now he pardoned the Big Osage for murdering three hunters on the Arkansas River the previous year and called it an old map. And he hoped that the Big Osage would reciprocate with good behavior. Well, officials viewed the hunters and trappers and from Arkansas Post as low-life scum, and they were inclined to not retaliate for their deaths as long as the citizens of St. Louis were not molested. So a pattern was established. The Osage villages in St. Louis were generally at peace and trading with each other, while the Osage would kill white hunters in the Ozarks and the Wichita Mountains and disrupt the trade at Nachitokas and Arkansas Post. The Osage would then come to St. Louis, apologize to government officials for killing the uh, hunters, and the government officials would give them gifts to show that all was forgiven, <laughs> and hopefully they would prevent trouble for St. Louis. Well, the non-Honjinga, the little old men, always seemed to know just how far they could go with the Spanish without incurring serious repercussions. When uh, Le Bas uh, citizen petition finally reached New Orleans, Governor Bernardo Gal de Gomez suspended all trade to the Little Osage of Missouri just as his predecessors had done. The merchants of St. Louis pressured the government not to take the action as it would financially ruin them, but Galvez persisted in his order. The Little Osage of Missouri made a truce with the Iowa tribe to their north, and the Iowa were now middlemen for British traders. So the Little Osage of Missouri got whatever they needed from the Iowa or by robbing traders on the Missouri River that were going to other tribes. Spanish attempts to evict the British traders from the Iowa country were feeble and elicited laughter and scorn from the Indians and traders alike. In fact, the British would stay active in that area as late as the War of 1812. Well, a British-led alliance of Indians attacked St. Louis on May the 8th, 1780, but the Osages in Missouri did not take part. On June 28th, Little Osage Chief Labalafre, the Scar, appeared in St. Louis under a flag of truce and Coincidentally, on the very same day that Lieutenant Governor Leba died, Acting Gov Lieutenant Governor Francisco Cardabona jailed Le Balafre as a horse thief. Cardabona probably understood Indian diplomacy even less than the inept Leba had. A few days later, the chief tried to escape by assaulting the sentry and seeking a way to disarm him. Labalafre was held in jail for 40 days and his wife was permitted to join him. Now, the official report states that one day in August, Labalafre kneed his wife in the chest, took a knife she was carrying, and stabbed her twice in the throat and once in the chest. He then grabbed a musket and tried to hit a soldier over the head. And the commotion roused the garrison, and Labalafre fought as one who does not look to his life. 
He was finally subdued and tied up, and three days later, his wife died. For the next six days, he refused food and drink, uttering a thousand oaths and making great threats in the name of his nation and injuring his face and all of his body parts by striking himself against the floor and wall. This caused his death more than any mistreatment which he received. And three days later, the scar died from these self-inflicted injuries. Now, <clears throat> Francisco Cruzat was reappointed as lieutenant governor on September the 24th, which was several weeks after LaBalafre's death, and he's the one that completed the official report on the incident. Now, LaBalafre attacking his wife, to me, is questionable, because contrary to European belief, Osage spouses loved and nurtured each other. And she evidently wasn't being held as a prisoner, so she could have gone any time she liked. And I also wonder why LaBalafre didn't use the knife on the soldier instead of his wife. Uh, in, now, imprisonment was worse than death to an Osage, so it is possible that he snapped while he was in jail. And I don't doubt that he became enraged and tried to escape, but I also think it's possible that there is a cover-up of abuse by the soldiers. When the little Osage arrived in St. Louis to greet Cruzat, he treated them with kindness and the customary respect. And he was surprised at their lack of outrage over the death of their chief. Now, it's very likely that the Nahanjinga, the little old men, had ruled against retaliation for political and economic reasons. Following the American Revolution, St. Louis faced threats on three fronts. The British in the north, the Americans in the east, and the Osage and Missouri in the west. Now, confrontations with the Osage very seldom resulted in bloodshed. But the fear of the Osages was so strong that the death of just one European sent all of the settlements into a panic. And the Osage would follow the pattern of showing contrition and promising good behavior in return for some gifts. The Spanish wanted the Osage in Missouri as allies against British and American expansion, but they failed miserably in their attempts at conciliation. So the cycle of confrontation and forgiveness, confrontation and forgiveness was repeated time and time again. Finally, the Spanish sought to create a buffer between their settlements and the Osage. Now, the Shawnee and the Delaware were enemies of the Osage, and in 1787, those two nations were invited to settle in Spanish Illinois. They were given a large land grant in the St. Genevieve district on which to settle, and probably about half of each tribe and accepted moved and moved to the area. On March the 7th, 1790, Lieutenant Governor Manuel Perez summed up Osage-Spanish relations in a letter to Governor General Esteban Miro. The Osages are the two worst tribes that we have on the Missouri, and at the same time the strongest, the more so if they unite. For this reason, it is necessary to temporize with them to some extent, handle them, as tactfully as possible in order to restrain their excesses as the few forces in the country <clears throat> do not permit anything else. Well, Perez attempted to control the Osages with a trade embargo, and we know how well that worked in the past. In retaliation, the big Osage robbed some traders on the Missouri River 
However, there's some indication that the traders were probably ignoring the trade ban and then claimed to have been robbed once they got back to St. Louis. Perez, next. Perez incited Indian mercenaries and wrote to Governor Francisco Luis Hector de Carondelet on May 4, 1792. I have done all I could to excite the Sox and Renards to go to war with them, meaning the Osages. At my request, several parties have gone into their country, and at this moment I learn that one such party has returned after killing five persons. Well, in New Orleans, Governor Carondelet issued orders to annihilate the Osage or at least drive them further west. Again, the St. Louis merchants and traders protested the government's actions as financially ruinous to them. However, the government this time took the step of suspending all trade with all Indians on the Missouri River for fear that the Osages would still obtain the supplies that they needed. Now officially at war with the Osage, Spain tried to gather a grand army of Indian mercenaries from several tribes. However, once again, Limited funds prevented them from adequately arming the Indians. Lieutenant Governor uh, Pierre Trudeau wrote to Carondelet on April of 18, 1793, I can assure your excellency that there are no nations in these territories who are not at war with the Osages, but with all one does not see any of them killing more than two Osages in a year, and they will never succeed in destroying them. Well, the continual harassment by the Sac Fox in Iowa eventually forced the Little Osage in the Missouri to leave the Missouri River Valley for good. The Missouri themselves were hit especially hard, and the survivors divided about half of them joining the Little Osage and the other half going up to uh, southeast Nebraska to join their kinsmen, the Odo. Uh, the Osage initiated no grand war movement against the Spanish or their Indian allies. They seemed to remain content to steal horses in the settlements, keep on trading with rogue traders, and picking off white and Indian hunters venturing into their territory. The only real casualty of the Spanish Osage War, besides the Missouri tribe, was the economy of St. Louis. Augustin Pierre Chateau knew that Carondelet's war against the Osage was being affected, but it still harmed their business interests. In April of 1794, August took six Osage leaders to New Orleans to lay out a peace plan before the governor. Choteau convinced Carondelet that if he and Pierre received a trade monopoly with the Osage, they could stop the Osage raids. Well, Pierre and August were married into the big Osage tribe, and they understood Osage temperament. They received a six-year contract, and the St. Louis merchants were pleased that the news that peace had been made, but they were not happy when they heard that the Chateaus had gotten a trade monopoly. Well, in September, several hundred Osages arrived in St. Louis to trade, and they exhibited <coughs> a docile and friendly demeanor that amazed Lieutenant Governor Zenon Trudeau. In the spring of 1795, the Chateaus built Fort Carondelet with their own money near the Osage villages at Mer de Saint, place of the many swans, which is in present day Vernon County, Missouri. Furs began flowing into the warehouses of St. Louis, and Osage raids stopped in Spanish Illinois. 
However, clashes between the Osage, the Quapaw, the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Shawnee, Delaware, and Cato's undermined Spanish efforts to bring about a general peace in Louisiana territory. Now, colonial officials and traders had a habit of meddling in Osage politics by recognizing certain individuals with gifts or medals to curry their favor. The size of a medal awarded to an individual determined how important that individual was viewed by the Spanish government. This led to intertribal schisms as these so-called government chiefs started bypassing the hereditary chiefs and the Nanhanjinga, the little old men. This breakdown of traditional leadership gradually weakened the ability of the Osage to present a unified front to European intrigues and later American expansionism. And Pierre Choteau recognized this gentleman, Pahuska Whitehair, as a large metal chief. And previously, he had been a small metal chief. This meant that the Spanish effectively recognized him as the principal or head chief of the Osage nation. Well, what this did was it deprived this the, uh, gentleman, uh, Arrow Going Home, also known as Claremont, his position as hereditary Zizou Gahigan. This is actually Claremont's son, banned by George Catlin in 1834. Well, Claremont and his followers were so unhappy with uh, Pahuska Whitehair getting a big medal, they left and they moved to northeast Oklahoma on the Verdigree River, where some dissident Osages had settled as early as 1786. Now these dissidents were actually <coughs> traditionalists who resented the Spanish meddling in tribal politics, and that's how the Os Arkansas Osage came about. In March of 1797, the Arkansas Osage stole horses and killed a settler near St. Genevieve. Settlers, miners, and lumbermen <coughs> abandoned the lead district in droves. The Chotos were now placed in a precarious position as Governor Carondelet started questioning their effectiveness in keeping the peace with the Osage. And Pierre assured the governor that there were still five or six hundred big Osage warriors under Whitehair that were abiding by the peace. Well, from 1797 to 1801, an uneasy truce prevailed between the Osage and St. Louis. In 1798, Governor Trudeau reported that the Osages had been harmful in the Arkansas district, but he also noted they leave the important district of Illinois in peace, which is beginning to be settled by a large immigration of foreigners. And these foreigners were Americans moving across the Mississippi River into Spanish Louisiana, including the Boone family. Uh, however, whenever Pierre Chateau would leave Fort Carondelet for any reason, the big and the little Osages would resume their horse stealing raids in the Spanish settlements. The situation was far worse in the south, however. Felix Trudeau, the commandant at Natchitoches, wrote in January of 1800, there is no year in which these cursed Osages do not kill some of the hunters of this post or the Arkansas post. And that very same month, Osages stole horses in St. Genevieve and the Merrimack settlement south of St. Louis. Excellent. Lieutenant Governor Carlos de Halt de la Sue berated Chief Whitehair and his children and demanded that the stolen horses be returned. Then in March, two American settlers were killed and a third was severely wounded at the Merrimack settlement. Pierre Chateau 
learned from Whitehair that the Raiders had been Arkansas Osage. De La Sue still regarded the Arkansas Osage as under the leadership of Whitehair and refused to deal with them directly. El Choteau informed De La Sue, I am going to do my utmost to have the murderer turned over to me, but I cannot assure you that I shall succeed because the chief, meaning Whitehair, has no longer any authority over them they do not recognize him anymore, therefore he cannot be held responsible for anything. Well, in February of 1800, the Kickapoo struck the Little Osages of taking 45 scalps and five prisoners, and for a while the attack brought some relief to Spanish Illinois. Whitehair uh, believed that such attacks on the dissident Little Osage and Arkansas Osage would cause them to shape up and rejoin the Big Osage. De La Sue asked Governor Casacalga in New Orleans not to deprive the Osage of traitors as it would hurt the good and obedient members of the nation, namely the Osages under white hair, and that it would also diminish profits in St. Louis by at least a third. Whitehair presented the war leader, or partisan, of the Merrimack raids to De La Sue. My father, after having wept for much time because those of my tribe had acted against your children, I have at last been able to bring the partisan of those who came last year to kill your children. Well, De La Sue put that man in chains. And at a council, La Chenier, an Arkansas Osage chief, spoke of his desire to reunite with the Big Osage. But he emphasized that the young men would not listen to him. De La Sue told the Osages that he was halting all trade and that he was punishing Pierre Choteau by sending him away to New Orleans because he had caused the Osages to commit evil acts. Pierre then rebuked the Osages for saying that they had lied to him about their intentions. Well, La Chenier and Whitehair made speeches of contrition and De La Sue promised that he would release the partisan if the Arkansas band rejoined the big Osage. So, De La Sue had used a stick and now he used the carrot by distributing presents of a hundred muskets, a hundred pounds of gunpowder, and three hundred pounds of lead. The partisan, in the meantime, grew deathly ill in jail, and Della Sue handed him over to the Choteaus to nurse back to health. After he got well, he escaped and fled back to his village. The Osage remained passive for some months but the Arkansas band never rejoined the Big Osage. Now the French reacquired Louisiana in 1800, but not long enough to impact the Osage in any way uh, in terms of policy. In 1802, Manuel Lisa was granted the trade monopoly that had been belonged to the Chotos. Well, the Chotos were a little upset by this, and they abandoned Fort Carondelet and moved their operations to the confluence of the Neosho, Verdigree, and Arkansas River, where the Arkansas Osages were. And in their move, they induced the, some more big Osages under Koshi Sigra, makes tracks far away, who was the Hunkagahiga, or war chief, of the Big Osage to move to that area too to trade with them. Well, the presence of the hereditary Zizu Gahiga and now the Hunka Gahiga restored in the Arkansas Osage the traditional leadership structure. The United, uh, so again, that for a brief period of time anyway, that traditional leadership was restored. 
Now, the United States purchased Louisiana on April 30th, 1803, and the Osage soon learned that dealing with the Americans was unlike dealing with the French or even the Spanish. Now, in conclusion, St. Louis was dependent on the fur trade with the Osage, who contributed on average anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the town's profits. The citizens often opposed the actions of their government towards the Osage because of economic harm. The Osages took actions to protect their territory, their resources, and their welfare, which the Spanish government interpreted as acts of disobedience or even wanton <clears throat> violence. The frequent turnover of Spanish officials, their unwillingness to accommodate Osage customs, the competition between St. Louis, Arkansas Post, and Natchitoches, it all came together to result in Spain's failure to develop a consistent policy towards the Osage. Economically, the Spanish were never in a position to pacify or to subjugate the Osage. And despite the deep tribal rifts that the Osage experienced during this time period, uh, the little old men, the Nonhonshinga, exploited these inconsistencies with the Spanish government to their tribe's benefit. Now these portraits of Hansenberg, Shinkawasa, on your left, and big soldier, Monchon Akitatanka, on the right, who were chiefs during the latter years of the Spanish regime and the beginning of the American regime, serve as a reminder as to who the real masters of Upper Louisiana were. Despite their pretentious claims to dominion over Louisiana, Spanish officials learned the hard way that in the Osage Quarter, they were indeed miserably weak. And the relationship of Spanish St. Louis to the Osage Nation ranged from one of trade to trepidation. Thank you.